Thank you, Charles and Joe, for inviting me uh, to moderate this panel on taking action in the supply chain. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rashab Kapate, and I lead uh, Environmental Defense Fund's engagement with the dairy industry to drive climate ambition and action. Um, taking a step back, right now, our food system is already grappling with the impacts of a hotter planet. About half of Kansas is suffering under drought conditions. Last summer, which was also the hottest summer ever, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, all reported widespread cattle deaths due to heat and humidity. In the past decade alone, California saw 19 extreme weather events that cost the state over a billion dollars each. These events impact farmers uh, who are on the front lines of climate change, but they also uh, impact companies as they encounter supply chain disruptions. The writing is on the wall, and the urgency to slow down warming has never been greater. As you know, methane is one of the most powerful levers that the food system can pull to slow near-term warming, warming and avoid uh, the worst impacts of climate change. Food and agriculture companies have the scale needed to reach millions of farmers through their supply chain, the ability to deploy capital uh, to help and support farmers in transition to climate smart agriculture, and the innovation engine to spark and rapidly deploy new products that reduce emissions. And there is good news. Um, major food companies are stepping up in a new way and beginning to support farmers in their supply chain on reducing methane emissions from livestock. As someone uh, noted yesterday, it is not a sustainability play, but a climate imperative. Dairy and beef companies are seeing uh, that they won't meet their net zero targets if they don't prioritize methane uh, and rapidly deploy products that are available, especially given methane makes up a significant portion of their overall greenhouse gas emissions. Taking the right steps now is critical, and today we have with us companies that are doing that and uh, organizations that are creating an enabling environment for it. It's a pleasure to be moderating this panel, and I'm looking forward to discussing the steps food companies are taking today to engage with their supply chains to accelerate climate action, uh, but also understanding where the challenges and solutions lie. We have a good mix in terms of supply chain engagement. We have uh, a major food company, a, dairy, a regional dairy producer company, an investor, and an NGO uh, that work on uh, with investors and corporate advocacy. I will start off with uh, questions for the panelists, and then we will have uh, some time for Q&A, audience Q&A in the end. Um, so with that, let's dive in. Um, starting from my right with me today are uh, Meryl Richards, uh, Program Director, Food and Forest Series. Uh, Meryl directs series a strategy for working with leading companies and investors to address climate impacts of the food sector. We have Hannah Stefanoni, uh, Producer Relations and Dairy Sustainability Manager at Clover Sonoma, where she champions the sustainability efforts for Clover Sonoma's network of 28 family-owned dairies. We have Jim Eckberg, uh, who's a research scientist at General Mills and leads the science and program design of General Mills Dairy Program that empowers farmers with on-farm data to drive sustainable solutions uh, that improve farm economics. And last but not least, we have Tom Bauer, uh, principal industry specialist for dairy at the International Finance Corporation, uh, which is the private sector investing arm of World Bank. Tom grew up on a Holstein farm and was previously the head of Rabobank Food and Agriculture Asia Research Group based in Singapore, uh, as well as a commodity trader in a life before that. Um, so with that, please give a huge round of applause for our panel, and we will begin. Um, so, Meryl, I want to start with you. Uh, Ceres has been tracking uh, company disclosures and progress through your uh, Food Emissions 50 initiative. Tell us what changes you've seen in the landscape in the recent years, uh, especially as it pertains to methane. Sure. Thanks, Prashav, and, and thanks so much for having me on the panel. It's great to be here with you all today. Uh, just to start with, for those of you who don't know Ceres, we are a, a nonprofit advocacy organization. We work with investors and companies to drive change in the economy from the inside out. 
so we work with, for example, um, investors such as the California Pension System, CalPERS, uh, which manages the, the pensions of probably a lot of your neighbors and friends. CalPERS recognizes that climate change and nature loss are real financial risks. You know, as Rashad was saying, you can see that in the food system, you can see it in other sectors as well. And so they engage with the companies of which they are shareholders to ensure that those companies are managing those risks, which then manages the risk for CalPERS and you know, your friends and neighbors and their retirements. So that's sort of a summary of what we do. Um, I direct our work with food companies and also our work on nature. And three years ago in 2021, what we found was that, or the situation that we were in is that investors felt they had a blind spot in the food sector because most companies were not disclosing their scope three emissions. Some were, but most were not. And so, uh, you know, investors couldn't even understand what that, the exposure was, what was the, the overall impact of the food sector on the climate. And so, Working with investors, we started an initiative called Food Emissions 50, through which investors engaged the 50 largest and, you know, by proxy, likely highest emitting North American food companies to disclose their scope three emissions, to set targets, scope three being their supply chain emissions, which in this sector is the majority, 80 to 90% of their emissions, to set targets that include those emissions, and then to develop plans, what are sometimes called climate transition action plans, to address those emissions. And what, over the past three years, what's happened is we've gone from about 20 of those companies uh, three years ago were disclosing their supply chain emissions, now um, 37 are, so nearly double. And in terms of target setting, we had about 17 companies that were disclosing their, or that were setting targets that include their supply chain emissions, and now we're at 32. So we now have the majority of, of at least the food companies that we're tracking in the North American food sector that have a better handle on where their emissions are coming from. And now what a lot of them are finding is that especially companies that source meat and dairy, a lot of those emissions are methane emissions from manure management or from an enteric emissions. And so now that they're understanding those emissions better, they're able to prioritize action and so we're seeing more companies, you know, not just some of the leaders that are here on this stage or companies like JBS and Danone and Nestle that have been acting on this for a while, um, but companies like Kraft Heinz and Starbucks and, and, you know, some of the other leaders have joined the Dairy Methane Action Alliance, which the series is working on um, with EDF. We have Yum Brands has now committed in, in the company's latest sustainability report to address methane emissions in its supply chain through the use of feed additives. McDonald's and Mondelez uh, partnering with Friesland Campina to address emissions from dairy sourcing. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the coming years now that the majority of the sector has an understanding that enteric methane emissions are a really substantial contributor to their supply chain emissions. Thanks, Meryl. Um, Jim, I want to come to you next. As a large food company, your value chain is global, but also complex. How are you working across your supply chain to reduce emissions, especially in the dairy sector? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I'll start by just sharing a little bit about General Mills. So uh, we've been in business for over 150 years. We recognize, like most of the companies uh, that have set science-based target, that climate change is an existential threat to our business because it inherently depends on a healthy farm, uh, healthy farm communities and economies um, to produce the ingredients for our brands. Uh, for this reason, we, along with many other companies, set a science-based target to um, reduce our scope three emissions, our entire company emissions, by 30% by 2030 and, and be net zero by 2050. So it's all really consistent with, um, you know, think what you've heard from a lot of our peers. Uh, dairy is our biggest, uh, is our biggest source, one of our largest sources of, of methane. It's uh, overall dairy is 10%. Uh, of our company's total footprint, and of course, uh, methane's a large, a very large part of that. And so, it's uh, near, it's it's a critical part of our portfolio. We're often thought of as being a cereal company, things like Cheerios, but we own um, um, we own YoPlay, Liberté, Mountain High, Haagen Dazs. Uh, so it's a it's a real key area for us uh, where we see that dairy can be a part of the solution. So, that all being said, um, you know, we we don't necessarily know where. Um, you know, where we'll end up in terms of 
delivering on um, on on impactful climate change solutions. But I will say that the most uh, the solution is going to look something like it has to be rigorous, it has to be actionable, and it totally has to be transparent. And so I want to share a little bit about what we're doing to to deliver on that, deliver our commitment, and really make this real. So we recognize right away that working with farmers and learning from farmers uh, in the regions where we source our ingredients is key for us to, to make meaningful progress. And so we started projects in uh, Michigan where we source for YoPlay and Liberté, uh, sourced in Quebec, working with farmers um, to implement um, regenerative agriculture practices on the ground, uh, improvements to agronomics and um, manure management and and uh, and cow management and what we what the big challenge we see is we have to go from that farm and the, those emissions all the way to our ingredients and so how do we how do we string all of this together to make this investable and actionable so uh, we've been working with a company called Logiac up in Quebec on developing a whole farm MRV it starts with the farmer and um, then doing an inventory of the whole farm emissions um, we we completely have to uh, look at the emissions from the entire farm because when you change one part of the system it has cascading effects through the system farmers are also often changing multiple parts of the system at the same time um, so we have to look at the net the change in net emissions and we deliver technical systems focusing on things like regenerative agriculture improving agronomics those those things can also reduce uh, methane emissions and, and then we focus on economics because we need to deliver things that are not only going to reduce emissions, but are also going to uh, improve whole farm economics. And so working with a group of 32 farms up in Quebec, we have um, you know, a data set that shows basically we can reduce emissions by about 25%. This is based on the Ag and Agri-Food Canada model, HOLOS, um, which is a peer-reviewed model. It's a factor-based model is how I often call it. Uh, and we've done we've done modeling of the how will the net operating profit change on these farms, and we're looking at about a 20 to 30 percent improvement. Now these are from regenerative type practices, so that's a big category. That includes things like perennialization of the crop rotations, dialing back a little bit on the corn silage, uh, increasing the amount of um, of high quality and well managed um, perennial forages in in the diet. It's about once you start to look at those. Look at those systems and those multi-cut systems. Now you have more opportunity for spreading manure throughout the year. You're getting manure out of the pits, uh, removing you know a lot of the time when that manure is producing a lot of the methane. Um, you know it's about improving animal health and welfare and, and uh, reducing how many how much how much how many replacements you really need on the farm um, because you're reducing your culling rate. So we look at these these practices to. Uh, you know, to, to improve the whole farm economics. Now, this is not to say that farmers don't have to invest in these practices up front, but, but we do see long-term economics based on, based on the modeling. Now, when we started this, uh, when we started this, this journey, you know, we, we had the mindset that this was really about our own footprint, and we quickly realized that this is something where we need to work on this as a broader initiative for the entire, um, you know, for the entire industry. Otherwise, we might just be, as they say, shuffling deck chairs in the Titanic. And so we see it not as a company level footprint anymore, but as a commodity level footprint. And we think that the Climate Smart Commodity Program and vision through the Climate Smart Commodity Grants is exactly the, the direction that we need to take, which is why we're working more on how can we take reductions that are happening on farm, develop life cycle analysis and protocols, to be able to apply those reductions to the milk itself. Because when it becomes a part of the milk and tied into the milk as a, you could think of it as another component that a company could, that the industry could support, it then becomes something that's not just a company-wide initiative, it's now a part of the supply as a whole. And we think that this is a way that we can not only bring along the companies that have done science-based target or volunteer commitments, but as a way to bring along the entire industry. And when we set up a framework like this, what's also exciting is that it provides a framework for farmers through all the innovation that they can, you know, that they that they're really the ones they're really the ones leading the innovation that they can then bring when they see the North Star is that is that reductions in emissions associated with that product that they're producing are gonna be captured in the value. That's very um, motivating, I think, for, for um, a lot of innovation to happen. And so we could not do this, we cannot tackle this alone. Working with farmers is the key thing. 
working with experts. It's a wicked problem, so we need to work with protocol development, life cycle analysis, agronomists, um, scientists. You know, a lot of our research is based on IPCC estimates of, er of, of error in, in emissions, and we know those are likely an underestimate of the actual error that, that things like nitrous oxides can be much more variable um, than what we might be expecting. So, so um, you know, we, we think this is really a, is a, is an opportunity, you know, for the industry to see value, both in the upfront, how can farmers save money doing these practices and becoming more efficient, and the long term, baking this in the commodity itself can provide value, I think, to the to the industry broadly. Thanks, Jim. Um, and as Jim laid out, working with farmers is a critical component of. Uh, taking action in the supply chain. As a regional dairy producer company, you're much closer to the farms than, than most of the larger food companies. And you've been working with some farms for four generations, five generations. Um, can you share more about the challenges and opportunities that exist uh, of working so closely with farmers? Sure. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is thank you guys so much again for putting on a conference like this. I think that having so many different stakeholders from different sectors of the industry is so important in this conversation. And just like last year, this conference has felt like such a success. So thank you again. But um, so just a little bit about Clover Sonoma. Um, we are a regional dairy brand about an hour west of here. Um, the majority of our dairies are located in Sonoma and Marin counties with some outliers in Humboldt as well as Stanislaus. We do have, um, you know, quite a different, not, maybe not a different model, but a, a unique model in that we contract directly with independently owned family farms. And so, you know, we have a pretty direct connection point to them through our producer relations team, which consists of me and two other people. Um, but because we do talk to them so often, I feel like we have a pretty intimate understanding of what their operations are like and know where those challenges and opportunities are. But to go back to generational farming, so um, we started taking on direct shippers in the late 90s and some of our dairies have been with us since then. So they've been with us for almost 30 years uh, and they are multi-generational farms. And um, that in and of itself creates a challenge. I would say like working with the dairies as a whole, there's more opportunities than challenges, but like just for a frame of reference, we have one dairy that has three generations working together with the youngest being in his early 20s and recently a graduate from Chico State and wants to digitize all of the herd's records, but his family still has cow cards and keeps them on paper records. So trying to um, like bridge that gap and, and help the older generations innovate is definitely a challenge. But like I said, I think, I think the main opportunities to working with um, dairies like this in, in our model is that we do have that direct connection and it is relationships that are based on trust. And I think that um, dairy producers are a skeptical group of people. And so the trust that they have had in Clover and in our producer relations team to, you know, be upfront and honest with them, what we're doing really serves us very well. Two years ago, um, we approached one of our conventional dairies to do a seaweed trial with Blue Ocean Barns feeding Bromonata or Asparagopsis taxiformis. And he was a little bit hesitant at first because he wanted to know uh, how it was gonna change his day-to-day -day operations. And it definitely did. He had to modify a lot of barns so that we could put green feeds in them and have a control and a treatment group. But inevitably he said, you know, if this is something that Clover wants to do, I think that it's gonna be beneficial to the industry and I'd be more than happy to do that. So having, I think having those relationships established are very important when looking at um, different sustainability initiatives. And so I, I'm very appreciative that I get to work with a very passionate group of people, which again also creates challenges, but um, but it's very rewarding, and I, I really I I have to thank them for what they do every day. Thank you, Tom. I want to come to you next. Um, World Bank's mission has evolved from poverty alleviation to ending poverty on a livable planet, uh, and that mandate has also shifted to include climate change in a big way. Um, so tell us about that shift in thinking and how that has. Uh, impacted or affected uh, IFC's ways of doing business? Well, um, first of all, I think just to make sure that it's clear, the IFC is part of uh, the World Bank Group, and we do lending to companies in emerging markets. Um, these are, the, if you look at the carbon footprint of like the dairy animal, 
we know that this is where the major problem exists, right? Uh, India, China, Brazil, um, a lot of animals that are underproducing. So we feel like this is a, uh, the cornerstone of what we should be focusing on in our investments uh, in these markets. The shift from uh, climate or from poverty alleviation to climate um, was a pretty smooth one, in my opinion, because uh, they kind of work hand in hand, right? Um, climate adaptation and poverty alleviation are, are pretty equal. Um, we look at a dairy farmer, a small dairy farmer in India, for, for example. If there's a drought, a climate uh, event like a drought, you have less forage for the animals, um, therefore you have lower production of those animals. What happens is basically um, the farmer has to cut cost. He gets rid of the, the hired labor in the, in the family farm, and he brings his children back from school and puts them on the farm to replace the hired labor. So, and most of the time, those children coming back first are the women, are the girls, and what, so we have all sorts of social, societal issues that are getting disrupted by climate change. Um, we have gender issues and we have productivity and farmer um, income issues that develop. So they're, they're very intertwined. Um, we're an organization that's you know, very massive um, and we have a wide variety of people from all over the world with, with academic backgrounds that are more impressive than you can ever imagine. But we have also different political persuasions as well. So we had a big debate whether we should even continue to invest in this sector because is, is, are the cows the new coal was the question that was proposed. Um, should we be investing in vegan um, sort of uh, agricultural systems because they're better for the climate. And I think, you know, we came back to a real level-headed solution that nutrition, uh, basic nutrition, and, and animal-based uh, agriculture is a fabric of most of the societies, you know, in these more emerging markets. And so it's something that we can ignore. If we were to stop financing that, we would stop financing um, feed grains, we would stop financing trade of commodities. There would be nothing less left to finance in, in a lot of sense of the word. So basically, we decided to stay in it, and we're going to focus directly on interventions, I want to say on a micro level, that focus on rumen health and improving the rumen and improving the feed quality coming into those cattle and emerging markets. So that's kind of our focus. And that we know will ripple through rural societies um, throughout the world. We don't want to create um, any kind of further war, any kind of cultural war. Um, last thing we need is more wars, right? So basically, we think that um, if you pull out animal agriculture from the, the landscapes in these countries, you will cause sort of civil, uh, sort of society issues. And with it will come all sorts of problems that you see. So we're in the long term. We're in this business, um, whether we like it or not. And we are here because we think decarbonization of the, the dairy sector is the most important thing we can do in these countries. Thank you. Um, and I want to come to you next. Yesterday, we heard the phrase uh, skepticism in the countryside. Um, through your work, how has the farmer perspective on methane evolved uh, in the recent years? So I've been working at Clover for four years, and I don't know if skepticism about methane is necessarily how I would define how the producers feel about it, but I would say their opinions and thoughts and feelings on methane is essentially oscillating. It depends on what day you talk to them, how they feel about it. And so one of the things I forgot to mention about Clover, or at least I think I forgot to mention, is that we source milk from conventional and organic dairies. And so I would say that the concerns are coming a little bit more from our organic dairies because um, they are on pasture per the NOP for at least 120 days, but usually out on pasture for significantly longer than that. So it's a lot harder and less practical for them to trap their methane and put an anaerobic digester on their farm. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't fit the model that they're doing. And so there's concerns about their ability to reduce methane that way. But then also um, along with the theme of this conference is talking about enteric emissions. As of right now, there is not a feed additive 
um, that is going to be able to move the needle in a significant way on the market or even coming to the market anytime soon that I know of. And so they're just very concerned about what options they're left with to be able to help meet climate goals. But I, I don't want to paint a negative picture because I do think on the flip side, there's a lot of positive things that have come out of the CDFA AMP program. So a, a quite a few of the producers up in the North Bay, not just Clover producers, have applied for and received AMP grants, which of course does have a methane benefit, but it also is having economic benefits to their farms. And that's another piece of the sustainability puzzle and very important one. You know, they are able to not only reduce methane, but produce compost that they can then put back in bedding that then um, saves on carbon dioxide emissions from hauling in different bedding, or they're able to put that compost on their pastures and then, you know, hopefully getting more um, soil moisture retention or better yields in their fields. So I think that like th through CDFA grant um, and AMP programs, they have seen a much better outlook on methane. And when you talk to them about it, it's not like, oh my God. But I, I would say one of the biggest concerns is, is amongst our organic producers because of the limited options and how they're gonna be able to reduce that footprint. And AMP is the alternate manure management program that uh, Roberta Franco presented about yesterday. Um, Meryl, in that vein, quickly, um, if you could share, how is the investor audience uh, perception about methane changed and uh, do they see a role for themselves, uh, especially uh, in terms of innovation um, or just broadly, what kind of key questions are they asking of their portfolio companies? Yeah, sure. So, so first of all, to clear up any misconceptions, Ceres primarily works with large institutional investors who are shareholders of companies. We don't work a lot with impact investors and venture capital firms. They, of course, have a clear role to play in this space in terms of financing solutions. But the investors that we work with are long-term shareholders, generally, of the companies that they hold. And they, their role, and what we're hearing from them, is that as long-term shareholders, they want companies to be investing in what they need to do today to ensure long-term financial viability for that company and for the sector as a whole as a way to ensure long-term shareholder value. And so um, what we've been asked by investors is, what does this look like in the food sector? So it's, it's a little more clear in sectors such as the energy sector, for example. You want an energy company as an investor and that's concerned about the impacts of climate change to be investing in renewables. You don't want them putting their money into new oil and gas infrastructure, which is a long-term investment that's not really going to be pres presumably viable 10 or 20 years down the road. We're phasing out those fuels. In the food sector, it's, it's a little bit less clear. And so what Ceres did in response to questions from investors is we really dug into what are leading companies doing in the food sector um, to address climate concerns in the long term. And what emerged was actually fairly similar, similar to what Nicole presented this morning. So first of all, it's engaging with suppliers as uh, you know, Clover Sonoma and General Mills are doing. It's providing incentives, it's supplier education, it's baking some of these things into supplier contracts where possible. Um, but, but it's important not to stop there because the, the long-term investments are investing in the actual innovations that are going to be needed. So, so what we hear from some companies who are perhaps not necessarily the leaders in the sector is, well, there's nothing we can do because the technologies are not there yet to address emissions for fertilizer to address enteric methane emissions. Um, but what leading companies are doing is engaging in the development of those technologies through their own venture capital arms if they have them, through in-house R&D, through piloting, through public-private partnerships like the enteric methane R&D accelerator, like the Greener Cattle Initiative. And then the third piece is, is around policy advocacy and collaboration. Uh, so Ceres does um, facilitate a working group of companies that engage in the policy space and come together to signal to policymakers that they want regulations that enable U.S. farmers to be climate leaders. And so that may be um, advocacy for public R&D, advocacy for regulation that allows products to come to market more quickly. So 
those are some of the things that leading companies are doing. And the role of investors in that space is to signal to companies that they as shareholders want to see those. And what we're hearing from, from investors is that they do. They, they consider this part of their fiduciary responsibility to ensure that companies are acting on climate and mitigating those long-term risks. Uh, Jim, I want to come to you next. General Mills released their uh, first climate transition action, action plan last month. Uh, which talks about a potential reduction in dairy emissions by 40% by 2030. Uh, what are some key levers that you plan to pull in being able to achieve these reductions? Yeah, that's, a, that's an advancement of our original goal, right? So we had set a goal of 30% reduction um, by 2030, and then we see lots of opportunity in dairy specifically, so we increased that um, to 40%. Um, and so... I'll start with what we're seeing so far. Um, you know, in the in the program that I mentioned up in Quebec, where we've been working with farmers on adoption of a multitude of different regenerative type practices, we're seeing around um, an approximate 25% uh, reduction in emissions. Now, that's on top of also the removals that we're seeing, which are which are small, like 4%. And so, we um, we see that this is this is a like a largely a you know so under my or, um, Underscores like the huge, you know, benefit or huge potential benefit of of regenerative um, and regenerative type practices, which again are this diversification of, of crop rotations and perennialization, increased cover, um, changes in manure management, and it's also just a lot of practical things too, such as once you do things, once you start to um, work on improved soil health, you you can dial back on things like urea, um, which we know is also energy intensive and and has greenhouse gas associated with it. Also, in, in the results I'm talking about, we do not have uh, 40 percent yet, and so methane is a is a huge part of this. And I think uh, looking for your support and looking for uh, the support of the academics on guidance for how can we work on these uh, new and emerging areas um, like feed additives, like genetics and selection. I will tell you today that we do not have great answers for this, and we we, we don't actually work at all on the the cow genetic side of of improving um, emissions. I, if I was asked today, who would my go-to person be for that? I would not have an answer for who who are we working with. But it's a huge, it's a huge area, um, you know, for us to look at. You know, if we can extend the longevity of that animal, and we can reduce how often we have to replace that animal and have a heifer which is producing methane but not milk. Um, you know, we think that's a that's something that we absolutely need to be working on, and it's a long-term thing to be thinking about turning over a herd and changing the genetics in, in a in a herd. So, um, I am here to be a, to ask for, uh, you know, like for the support from the community. I think it's not just General Mills asking that, but it's it's the other companies, it's our peers that need clear guidance on how. Um, how can we reach these goals? How can we get beyond that 30%? Because we don't have, we don't have clear guidance on it, on it today. Thanks for being so candid, Jim. Um, Hannah, we know that methane solutions are not one size fits all uh, and vary based on geography, farm size. We've heard yesterday as well that farmers need more options, uh, not just for extensive systems, but uh, for pastoral systems, smallholder systems, organic systems. Um, what are your farmers sharing with you about what kind of support they need to implement methane solutions on the farm? So I'm probably like the 50th person to say this in the last two days, but first and foremost, they need some sort of capital um, investment. They're not going to be able to fund these types of projects on their own, especially like I said, an organic dairy in Northern California that's been, you know, has received $750,000 from CDFA for an AMP grant. They just don't have that money to put up on their own. So first and foremost, I'd say it is um, capital, no matter where it comes from, or if it's in the form of feed additives eventually, like there's, there's going to need to be some sort of incentive, but I also think that it's going to be very important that we, you know, talk to the researchers and figure out if there is an actual payback on that. So does the feedback pay for, or I mean, does the feed additive pay for itself and then, you know, have additional income in, in addition to that? I think someone today said it has to have at least a two to one, and I could definitely see where that comes from, especially in our producer's mind. Um, thinking about a one-size-fits-all approach, you know, we have 
the majority of our dairies in Sonoma and Marin County, and most of them are um, pasture-based dairies, but even someone who's across the road from someone else has a completely different operation. And so when looking at each of the farms and what their opportunities are, you have to look at them all on an individual basis because we have dairies who are still milking in a California walkthrough to dairies that are milking in a rotary to dairies that are milking in robots. And so the range of innovation amongst our farmers is very, very vast, specifically in Sonoma and Marin County. But, you know, if someone is milking in a California walkthrough, that doesn't mean they're not willing to innovate. Again, they, they just don't have the capital to update, you know, what they're doing. And so um, that's very important. But I will say amongst all of our dairies, especially the organic ones, I think our largest opportunity to reduce methane is improving feed efficiency and reducing methane intensity. I do think that, you know, there is the opportunity to improve pasture quality, improve rotational grazing and just getting, you know, the same amount of milk out of that cow with less methane by just tweaking management practices. And so that is that is the one thing I could say is a one size fits all for all of them. Thank you. Um, Tom, finance is a big piece of the puzzle. Um, and most current methane solutions aren't a source of revenue. There is no increased productivity or sometimes require extensive uh, operating and capital expense. So when financing non-revenue generating solutions, we end up mostly with debt instruments. And uh, it, those are not very um, sought after. So what are ways do you see to be creative here and look for uh, instruments beyond debt. Yeah, I think um, you know this is something that we can we continue to to work on internally. It's not yet set in concrete, but we have we have about a billion dollars invested in the animal protein segment right now, uh, most in debt and equity. An average size loan is about twenty five million. This is mainly going to the processing uh, sector. And then the processor, in turn, will have extension programs that will help the, the smallholder farmers. We think um, setting up uh, sustainably linked loans um, with some of these processors where they get discounts and interest rates can help push some of this money through and then mobilize the private sector banks to, to assist as well. So what that means is basically we would set like a benchmark we're working with DSM right now in in in, uh, in Brazil on a project with Alvar Dairy, um, where we're going to help. They're going to help set the benchmark on where GHG is on the the company's um, GHG emissions, and then we will uh, tie the loan, uh, the interest rate to the loan on whether they meet certain KPIs throughout the the lifetime of the loan, a seven year loan, for instance. Um, or a debt or a equity instrument as well. So that's kind of the, the way we are going to start to roll out this, this process through that. We also have, um, for certain countries, you know, we work in different countries, but some countries are fragile and conflicted um, environments or the poorest of the poor countries. They also have money to um, that coming in from a concessional funding source that lowers the interest rate as well. Uh, that can be used for climate mitigation on, on the farms. Um, and then, of course, we are leaning on civil society organizations as well as foundations to actually provide grant money to help with some of these things like uh, miniaturized biodigesters that could help on, on some of the farms. Um, and then, uh, in addition, uh, we have a cool cow initiative because a lot of our dairies in, in the Southeast Asia are, you know, it's getting very hot for them. So uh, we have grant money that will help them install uh, certain fans with certain velocities and droplet size of water that go hits the cows. Um, that helps uh, increase product production about 30% in some of those environments. Um, so a combination of everything like that has to be used in this sort of case because we don't have an inf infrastructure you know, bill that we can rely on. We don't have state funding in, in most of these countries. And most of the time, the governments are a bit hands off and, and cash strapped. So that's that's the approach that we're going to be taking. Thank you. Um, I will come to audience uh, in just a moment. But um, one theme that you alluded to, Jim, was that of industry co collaboration. And uh, General Mills and Clover Sonoma are both members of the Dairy Methane Action Alliance. Uh, why did you join the alliance? What What is the value that you see of sector-wide initiatives like this? Uh, why not just act alone? 
I mean, the question, the the challenge is is much bigger than us, and I'm and also the learnings are are much bigger than us. Um, we we want to. We know that we're not the experts in this. That we simply try to work with the experts, and you know, one of those expert groups that we're working with is Concord Ag Partners on better understanding feed additives and working on summarizing uh, the current results and looking at feed additives like Agilent. Because in a whole farm model, if we can improve the efficiency, not just not just work on the reduction in enteric emissions itself, but if there's feed additives that improve efficiency, that is also going to get picked up um, in terms of the reduction in the GHG intensity. So we joined the alliance so we could learn learn from other partners. Uh, we joined the alliance because we recognize that methane is a very scary greenhouse gas. That um, you know things like even the half life itself we don't take for granted because the hydroxyl radical that uh, is responsible for that is not necessarily um, you know it's, it, it's it's a variable itself you know it also can change and so so um, you know methane is a very scary gas and you know when I think about methane I don't think about Earth I think about other planets like Pluto it's a gas that really makes this planet unlivable. Anna, you want to add something to that? Sure, I agree with everything that you said, and I, I know that Clover is probably significantly smaller than all of the other companies that's in the Dairy Methane Action Alliance, and I think that partnering with EDF and being able to collaborate with the larger companies and us coming together as a whole is so important, and you know, this is obviously an opportunity, I don't want to call it an issue, an opportunity that is, you know, set forth for the entire dairy industry and to be a part of this and being able to collaborate with EDF and General Mills and Danone and, and every, every other player that's in there is just going to be a great way for us to all learn from each other. And I, I think that that's very invaluable and I'm just very appreciative. Thank you. We definitely appreciate the farmer voice that you bring to the group. Um, so with that, I want to see if uh, there are folks in the audience who have any questions for our panelists. Thank you for the discussion. This was uh, very interesting. Jim, you mentioned something that I, I wrote down here because I thought it was um, something interesting. You mentioned the concept of climate smart commodities. Um, and then my question is, how can we make sure that we develop a system in which these um, environmental services that farmers are doing um, can be funded through the normal maybe, I don't know, how we form milk price, for instance, in the US, and then we make sure that farmers get the benefit um, and do not rely only on incentives uh, to pay for, for these um, initiatives. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I just want to elaborate and also reiterate a little bit about you know, what, we're, what, we're, what we're saying when we're talking about climate smart commodities. What does that really mean? It's, you know, it's taking those reductions that are happening on a farm, and instead of those reductions being an emission factor modifier for a company, right? They could be a mission factor modifier for the milk, um, and then as as the program expands, um, then I think there will be potential that these emission factor reductions, um, you know, will start to get to critical mass in a in a sourcing area, and we'll have a sense as to what is the emission factor uh, of the milk itself, and then how is that how is that actually going down? Um, you know, I think we need to answer your question, you know, to your point more directly. Moving towards, you know, taking those reductions and comparing them to, say, a baseline, saying, well, let's just say it's one kilogram CO2e per one kilogram milk. Let's say that's what you started off, that was your baseline 2020. Um, farms that are below that, you know, there, there, there should be, there can be some value associated with that. What that value is worth, as a scientist, I, I don't know what it's worth. My grandpa would say it's worth what someone's willing to pay for it. It's a, it's a discussion for suppliers and the industry to have more broadly. But when we set up the system and that's what we're working to do, then we can have those discussions. And making those reductions, bringing those into the commodity itself, bakes that value in for the producer. The value has to go back to the producer because at the end of the day, they're the ones taking the risk. They're making a huge investment to start working on a 
climate smart agriculture. And that's not cheap. That's a lot of upfront cost. That's tens of thousands of dollars for small producers in, in Quebec to start some journey like that. So they're taking a big risk. Um, it should pay off for them. It should be more economical. But there also is, is benefit for them to, to capture that, to, for them to be incentivized. So uh, if we don't think of it that way, I think we're just going to be stuck kind of an early adopter phase, you know, the, the folks that are interested and are willing to do it. But we have to move to critical mass in the industry. So thanks for the question. Hi, thank you for the all the presentations. I think everything is very salient. Um, I want to relate to the finance question, if I could. Um, I've consulted a lot for IFC, primarily in East Africa and West Africa. And we always promote, and I think I'm one of the earlier climate smart agricultural consultants. So climate smart agriculture is always three pillars. I think there's a consensus among all of us who do this that the first two are mitigation and adaptation. And there's differing opinions about the third. Some people will say it's food security. Some people say it's resilience. In the work that I do and most of the work that I think that my colleagues do, especially in the global south, the third one is always increased profitability for the grower. It can be increased production, but at the end, it's the bottom line. Um, and it works because after all, and this is where I'm going, is because when we do a climate smart agricultural project, there's a lot of benefits, there's a lot of ways of going about it. We always start with a feasibility study. But in the end of the day, we are increasing efficiencies. It's water use efficiency, it's nutrient use efficiency, it's energy use efficiency, it's labor use efficiency. And efficiency is another word for conservation. And I can't tell you the number of times I've done these presentations and people will stop me halfway through and they'll say, Michael, everything you're saying is great. We'd love to do it. We just can't afford to do it now. And I say, lock the door. No one's getting out. Because at the end of the day, if the variable annual expenses are not less than business as usual, it'll never fly. I mean, I farm myself for a lot of years, and all farmers are risk averse. Do anything to my field. You got a great innovation? Do it, do it, do it. I'm not paying for it. But if it turns out that it's profitable for me to do it, great, I'll do it next year. So I come back to this idea of efficiency. And in the global south, more so than here, incentives, rebates, those kinds of programs don't work. Don't even try to go there. It's a business proposition. And if at the end of the day, a regular commercial business proposition has to be profitable for the guy that's got one hectare, the guy who's running you know, a million hectares for General Mills wheat. So at some point along the way, this has to be framed as not as an incentive, but as a good business practice, whatever the solution is, whether it's vaccines, whether it's different feed, but I agree with a lot of other people up there that, and I'll be quiet, is that, uh, you know, most of the people that I work with are small herds. There's no one that's got to be. I saw the poster out there with a beautiful dairy people give their eye teeth for, but that's not the reality. So to be able to trap these animals and inoculate them or change, somehow force them to eat something else or a salt lick that has got some kind of you know agent in it or whatever it happens to be um but these people are ready the people in the global south can i say one more thing i'll be quiet um all right i'll be quiet yes i, I want to make sure we have time for maybe one more question in the audience but i agree yes productivity is a key lever in the global south and i think uh, there are many organizations that are working to to drive that and um, see that as the first step in a series of steps. Can I respond really quick? Um, I I completely agree that we that that working on improving efficiencies is a is a practical. It's low hanging fruit. This is a this is a great place to start with those with those uh, innovative farmers that want to work on it. As we start to talk about these uh, farther reaching these feed additives. I, as a as a 
scientists at a, at a company that makes food that the world loves, that's what we're known for, we are, you know, there's, there's concern around some feed additives like like bromoform, where the active ingredient can have some human health impacts. And as you work as as we as we work on and explore that stuff, I just want to say that it's not just the uh, potential human health impacts. It's not just the human health impacts that are proven. It's the human health impacts that are perceived as well for consumers. So I want to leave you with that. Thank you, um, Ash. Go for it. Make it short. Oh, I will be short. The in some ways we're talking about the the global south. The the ability to realise the gains that we've made here um, in California in the global north, um, the production gains. It's, it, that's low hanging fruit because we know how to get a dairy cow in India or Africa from one or two liters or five liters a day to increase. And like Ermias is doing great work in Vietnam, in Africa. Joe's doing great work in India, etc. How do we how do we leverage the overall advantage? Because that's where the big opportunity is and not just look in our own backyard, but look at the globe, because methane is um, ambivalent to international borders. So look at this globally and invest where we can have that, get that up, make the most of that low-hanging fruit. Tom, you want to take that? Yeah, the, the way that we're working um, with that is, is basically looking for those companies that are in the, the first world, the, the emerging, the developed world, that are investing in, in the emerging markets. And with them, they bring along best practices and expertise to get the farmers along the, the, the right direction on productivity. But your point about um, efficiency gains and uh, what we do on, on anything relating to sustainability, if there isn't a, a profitability sort of uh, part of that equation, the whole thing falls flat. There's no question about it. Um, and we're then being pushed to do things that sometimes are not really realistic for a small farmer. It may be just tweaking the ration of, of the, the animal a little bit, finding local feed stuffs that are, are available, and then the sequence in which that animal eats and drinks throughout the day. These may be enough to get this, this uh, herd down to about 20 to 30 percent reduction in GHG. Completely agree with you on that, um, but I do think there's a lot of what we're, we're seeing since COVID. We're seeing a retraction of of developed world uh, investments in the emerging markets, and we're seeing more investments in regional companies inside these these markets. Um, that's fine, but I think there's a trend that's a little bit disconcerting because, you know, as an old commodity trader, I see a, a pattern here of protectionism that could lead to the next sort of food crisis. And um, I'm a little bit concerned about that when I see milk production in Europe stagnating, when I see milk production in the U.S. stagnating, and in New Zealand stagnating. These are all major powder exporters. and uh, that's another issue, and I think we have to re-engage the, the companies to be involved in the emerging markets because that's where a lot of the problems are. That's where the market is growing the most. So um, let's work on that together to break down these sort of protectionist attitudes. Uh, I'll quickly add, though, uh, just um, that we need to be cautious about what the goal is, uh, and if the goal is to increase the overall productivity uh, to th and efficiency to the levels of California, we need to think about the overall systems and what system exists there, as opposed to just uh, trying to chase chase a goal which is set in a completely different context. Um, I have one last question for the panelists. Um, I think from the discussion uh, today, we've established and agree that food companies have an opportunity to play here uh, to lead on driving down methane livestock. And we've also talked about some challenges um, that, that we're facing. Uh, but food companies are also in a, a position where they can send critical market signals uh, that can drive innovation and help unlock some solutions. Um, so I want to do a quick um, um, just go to everybody and, and ask, what is the top challenge 
uh, that you think would make all the difference uh, in accelerating private sector action uh, in livestock methane? Meryl? Um, I can start, and, and perhaps this is an easily answered one, which would be wonderful. Um, I think we need really good economic data on these solutions and, and really good cost data. Uh, I was in a conversation with a, between an investor and a company, you know, can't tell you who, a few months ago, and the company was talking about here are all the, you know, the great investments that we're making to address our emissions, and the investor asked, well, do you have marginal abatement cost curves for all of those, and and how are you prioritizing what is going to be most efficient? And you know, to the extent that you know there are problems with MAT curves, but to the extent that we can have really good information on on what's going to be cost effective from a farmer level, and then also from from a company level who's perhaps providing incentives or investing in these solutions, that would be a a, a real help. I I feel very similar to what you just said. Economic data, especially when talking to producers, but also like animal production and efficacy data. A lot of the questions that I get when talking to producers about feed additives specifically is, um, have they done whole lactation trials? Are there reproductive um, parameters? Were those studied? And it's hard to say yes to a lot of them. And so I know we talked about this yesterday on one of the panels that having full lactation or multiple lactation studies is not simple, but um, I don't I don't really have an answer for that, but I do wish that that was something that we had a lot of access to because I think that would help drive that conversation a little bit quicker and further. Yeah, we need programs that are investable, um, actionable, and uh, and scientifically rigorous, right? So we need to work, I know it sounds cliche, but we need to work together, right, with the farmers, scientists, protocol developers, life cycle analysis, suppliers, companies, uh, because we're we're trying to tackle a wicked problem here, which is which is quantifying a greenhouse gas on a farm and or modeling it and then trying to track uh, those reductions through all the way to a pound of milk and to a product. So um, no one single person's expertise covers all that. There, we need to collaborate in ways we haven't before. Um, I think, you know, I think more money in, in uh, venture capital, I think, going into, into solutions. I think also research uh, at, at the university levels, we need to have that not just in the US, but in across our emerging markets. And we need to educate the consumers where their food comes from. Because I think there's still a big misconception about you know, how, what it's like to farm, what's it, what's it like to farm under the conditions that the farmers are facing with climate change. There's a huge uh, gap in education of where people get their food from. So scientifically rigorous programs that have animal health data, economic data, more money going into solution, and uh, collaborating like we have never done before. Sounds easy, right? Let's get to it. Uh, a huge round of applause for the panel. Uh, thank you so much.